So usually when I'm talking to an audience who really doesn't know what these things are, I, I take the standards as rules or blueprints, right? So the way we would differentiate in this room is if you think of the, the electrical appliances, the lights and things in this room, right? There are light switches and plugs, and behind the walls there are cables. And for safety and for lots of you know, interoperability, compatibility, there are standards that say this will be 220 volts, so many amperes. And the reason is, is so that when I plug in my laptop, it, there's not a big flame and a poof, not gone. Okay, for safety and, and things like that. But what's also true is that at some point they decide to redo this room, they can go to somebody else completely different from whoever built these lights and buy those lights. You buy cheaper lights or more expensive lights or anything like this. You get interoperability. And clearly, there are a lot of very clever things that use electricity. We saw in one laptop for five years before, earlier in the show. OK, it didn't exist very long ago. And there's tremendous innovation and inventiveness. All right, sometimes just for the advancement of technology, sometimes for the social good things like this. And so standards form this foundation, and open standards in particular, are developed in a very open, maybe transparent way. We can see how they're developed. We can see whose opinions right, factored into the final standard, or is there some great big gorilla that walks in and says, you will do what I tell you to do. This standard will do whatever my product needs it to do. It's only 6,000 people. <laughs> I had to mention it. Okay. So, transparency, community, some notion of being freely available. I put freely in quotes because there are licenses, right? So it's not just free to do whatever you want. Even the GPL, right? In some sense, you have to obey those rules. So it's free, but free according to the rules, whatever the GPL said. And then, of course, open source is code, once again, community, once again, transparency, meritocracy in terms of development, and again, notions of, here's the GPL, really development, things like this. So these notions of openness, right? people know what's going on. People know who's pulling the strings, how decisions are made. And we come to something with that the laws, whether it's these types of open, Right. Um, and my job is I'm vice president of open source and standards for IBM, which is to manage all these types of things um, across the corporation. Now, there's this other notion, which is innovation. Innovation is everybody wants to talk about innovation. Every corporation in the world seems to want to talk about it. So here's the short cut. Innovation is good. Right? Okay, everyone's hit hand. Who thinks innovation is bad? Okay. Yeah, you know, it's one of these kind of obvious things. Innovation is good. The problem is, is where is it coming from? Right? Not this no notion of good or bad. How do you get more of this stuff? And this innovation could be like right before your computer projects do. You know, that would be good innovation. Right? Or if you're a company, innovation is coming up with new products or new services, or some way to provide value to your customers that they will give you some money. Right? Things like this. Advancing the state of the art for whatever reason, for technological reasons, for financial reasons. Now, most people tend to think of innovation in very technical terms. This laptop is better than last year's laptop because it's got better chips cooler or it uses less energy it's innovative. Okay, this software is smarter than the software I had last year. Okay? Um, and that's fine, that, that can be, alright? But this this kind of new sort of thinking uh, could be technical, could be, you know, of course we're generally scientific in terms of healthcare, biology, chemistry, physics, whatever. Straight straight up mathematical innovation. I'm a mathematician by training. New theorems, new corollaries, new memos. Great new ways of thinking about things. But it also factors into new businesses. Right? New ways of making money, new ways of coming together. You know, we've got virtual companies, we've got companies of 
software developers scattered around the world who have never met each other, and many of them never wrote with each other. We couldn't have done that 20 years ago. Okay, and yet they're doing these things. Uh, there's this question that keeps coming up, for example. Has Linux been innovative? Or have they just been copying Unix and Windows? What is the innovation in that? Now, first of all, that's a total BS, right? So aside from that, um, you know, it, it's really kind of clear that these you know, windows in particular include some function um, Right, but let's even sidestep that question. Has Linux been integrated in its effect of the economics of the computer industry? That is, are there new businesses that exist because of has money been made because of the news? Right. That wasn't made before in that way. And I will tell you from an IBM perspective, several billion dollars of revenue later, yes. Okay. So therefore, when we think of innovation, it's important not just to concentrate on the code, on the semiconductors, on whatever, the scientific aspect. It's important to focus on the downstream implications of whatever it is you're creating. Okay? So think about the bigger picture and think about what happens later on for innovations. So uh, let's look at something slightly different here. I mean, you know, we're used to things like Linux and databases and all this stuff like this. This is an open source project called Sahana. How many of you have ever heard of Sahana? <laughs> okay. Right. You know, you know, okay. So, um, so here's the problem. Um, natural disasters happen. Certainly, in this part of the world, the tsunami several years ago. Uh, southern part of the United States, Hurricane Katrina, but also earthquakes, and volcanoes, and forest fires, and all sorts of things happen with some regularity around the world. So, what happens in these situations? Lines of communication typically go down. There's a lot of damage, of course, both to people and loss of life, injured people, uh, loss of property. It's hard to get to these areas, right? And not only that, you have the problem is that all these other people around the world suddenly show up and say, can we help, can we help? Can we send 10 people? Can we send blood? Can we send this? And, you know, the government, And suddenly, everything changes. And so the responsibility is to help you know, recover as quickly as possible, save everybody who can be saved, right, in every sense of that word, get the infrastructure back up and running again, use what help you can, and then generally just recover, as I said. So abstracting away the, the human aspect, just for a second, that. Um, this is a management problem, right? It's a management of putting the right resources in the, in the correct place, right? Getting people to do what you need to do, right? Executing very quickly. We know how to do software that does that type of thing. That, that's what one does, right? In business and elsewhere. So, some folks here um, in this part of the world, in Sri Lanka, colleagues of mine from IBM and many others as well, got together and said, we can write this type of software. We know how to do this. So that after these disasters, someone can come in with a server in tow, with a laptop in tow, and just run this and start bringing the systems back up in terms of the information coming together, and organizing the tasks that happen. Right? And contrast this right, with sort of Mr. Software Salesman says, oh, there's a disaster in this country. I'm going to go to the Prime Minister's office and say, I'm so sorry we've had this disaster. I've got this handy dandy software. Let's negotiate a deal. <laughs> okay? So this, there are commercial software like this. There is one. Uh, but this is exactly a very nice application of open source software. We're not beating gender X over the head. We're not coming up with a new operating system.
system, we're not getting rid of their word processor or anything else in the world. This is just a good idea because it helps people. Okay, so straight out community development of software that helps people. And I give this example because there is a lot to open source software that today is almost political. Right? This is just how it's not hard to argue against this, right? And so it's good as an example at one end of what people are trying to accomplish through community development. Okay? And then if there's everything else as well. Um, so you know, it comes down to when we think about innovation, we talk about starting new businesses or, or, or new efforts, you have to ask, have standards and software and open source software big catalysts? Have they driven new efforts? Right? And so the obvious answer is yes, they have. And sort of the examples here, things like HTML, HTTP, Kubeck, right? World Wide Web. And what really got that off the ground is still over 60% of all the web servers used is Apache, starting in the late 1990s. Now IBM had three web servers, HTTP. We didn't always talk to each other. Right? They did one. They did one. They did one. Um, and sometime around 98 or 99, somebody at IBM came to the brilliant conclusion that that was absolutely stupid. So one, it was stupid to have three, right? And two, it was stupid for us to create our own web app server, that web server, um, because you know, there are so many things it does. It's fairly prescribed. I mean, you, you kind of evolve it a little bit, but you don't forever keep adding thousands of features to it, and you certainly don't make it terribly custom. All right. So if we said, look, we're going to stop doing this, we are instead going to go with the Apache HTTP Okay, we'll contribute to that, and we'll build what we built on top of that. And this was a real radical change for IBM. We didn't invent it, we didn't write it. Trusted the community to continue to develop something which would be a value. And that was the beginning of coming out of the large shop. It didn't hurt, but this was a very high quality. Okay? And so other things happened, such as around the services, right, starting in, in 2000. Okay? Right. Starting in 2000 with web services. In fact, it's seven years ago this month. This is now almost, you know, you can talk to any analyst you want. Roughly speaking, it's almost a $20 billion business. Seven years. Open standards, a little controversial. We did it with Microsoft. I had people in other event, and I'm saying, you know what you're doing here. Okay, but in fact, we didn't have a choice. We had customers who came to us and they came to Microsoft and said, cut it out. All right, we're tired of you two arguing. We don't want to see this huge split of the Microsoft version of the world and the Java version of the world. We constantly have to be dealing with these two different things. And the fight went back to the OS2 days in the early 90s. Okay. So, um, so in fact, was a little experiment to see if we could work together without killing each other. But the big prize that year is UDDI. Remember you need that. Well, so it is the big here. Uh, I'm sidestepping the whole rest of the study. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we, we have open source that does this, and today the really hot topic is the silver cup. Which has the potential of having a similar change in the industry. This is being fought by Microsoft. So, other open source that's been uh, very successful, uh, of course, open office, Eclipse for, for development, and the Firefox web browser, which proved that there were new things in the browser. Uh, all right, so why do we like this? In fact, open source is a big source of innovation. We spend five and a half billion dollars a year in R&D. We don't come up with every brilliant idea in the world that that, okay, we try to learn to work with the community. Now, this isn't really a foreign idea. If you look at IBM research, about 
thousand people there. Right? I was an IBM researcher for 15 years. These are all former academics, right? These are PhDs that come out of you know many of the best schools around the world. You know, when I when I was a mathematician, I didn't charge people for corollaries and theorems. Why we share? We advance the idea. And so this notion of open collaboration is very natural to researchers. Okay. Um, and so we have found that it's, it, it works very well with us. It's a good approach for developing emerging standards. Right. So the story with what happened with SOAP here. So April 26, 2000, we announced with Microsoft SOAP spec, 50 whole pages, back in the days with standards. You know, this. Um, and that was nice, you know? And, and I, I was part of the team that was doing this. Um, and as an aside, that April 26 was a tremendous amount of press. You go back and see it, even in the world. Everybody did an article about this. I counted over 50 articles that day. And to show my naivete, I was thinking, wow. These guys must really think this so this electronic external envelope is really cool at the Of course, that wasn't the story at all. It was after eight years, I did Microsoft working together and on something. Right? That was the key thing. But what was happening was is that it was drawing attention away from the strictly technical to forces in the industry that were following up on the web itself. Right. So this was a Wednesday when we announced it. On Friday, we put some Java code, Java, Java libraries out on Alcoworks, which is our library for kind of new things. By Monday, there had been 400 downloads, and the next month, we brought it to a patch. And I think absolutely that and subsequent things like that drove the early web services because if you were interested in what this soap thing was, you didn't have to spend several weeks, several months writing the process. Here it is. Write it, take it. If you're in healthcare, you want to do web services, tomorrow you got it. Okay, you can learn from it. Here's the code. If you don't want to use hard code, write your own code. But at least you can see how it's done. Right? And then it's a source of competition in the marketplace. Now, Competition is great for customers, right? So you have to think of yourself in, in, in several different roles, right? So you can think of yourself as a technologist. Maybe at some point in your life, you might think of yourself as an important part of the business, maybe the leader of the business, right? But you also have to think of yourself as a customer. And you've been customers all your life, different types of things, right? In, in the industry. So from a customer perspective, competition is good. Because if there are two different people out there trying to sell me something similar, they're fighting each other to get my business. And how are they doing that? Well, you would expect them to tend to try to produce better products. That's good for me. And since there are two of them, they've got to be on the price. So I can potentially Get, right, if they don't do anything illegal, I make a deal. Um, I can potentially get better products at lower prices. So that's a very good type of thing. Now, the other type of thing that happens is, again, over time. So, with open source software, what we're seeing is that <coughs> markets that seem to be completely closed off get enlightened. So this happened with Firefox, as I just said, with the browsers. Everybody, well, everyone, you know, Windows World has always been using Internet Explorer. End of story. We use whatever Microsoft gives us. So. And you know, from the perspective of them, you know, it's everyone's using it. They've got lots of things to do with their resources. They don't have to keep doing that. But an independent group of people, right, led by a 17-year-old, right, at the beginning there, decided, oh, 
which is Mozilla code base, refactored it, reduced it, right? Built a new architecture that was more extensible. And suddenly you have this rebirth of what was considered really dead in terms of the code environment. Can that happen again? Can that provide new opportunities for other people to come? And so, so it's a good thing, it's a risk, right? Now what it means from, from our perspective, or your perspective, if you get competitors, right? So what if you have an established product or offering, okay? And this could be an, an open source project, right? This very much could be something you were working on which is an open source project. What do you think when you get up the next morning and you see an email or a story that says there's a brand new open source project doing exactly what you've been doing for the last year? Okay, I'm sure you're going to go, yes, great. So the official vendor PR, let me tell you what this is. We think this is excellent because it validates our approach. Right? They all say this. <laughs> right? And this is a way of saying, damn, you know, we really wish they didn't exist. Okay. All right. But what it means is it's going to drive you off to produce a better project, a better product, a better okay. And maybe ending up cooperative. And I'm sure you've seen this. Okay. So how do we use open source? Well, lots of ways and varied ways. So, so the first thing i got to warn you about is IBM is about a third of a million people. Okay? So no two IBM people are going to do anything the same way. Okay? And there's a lot of power This machine here, which, you know, for those of you who can't believe, just so you know, yes, it's running Windows now, but it's a dual boot that we're going to do. And I'm waiting until I get home, and I'm going to get it. Is the presentation in uh, open document format? No, it's a PDF. Um, but the original is open document. Okay? Because, and, and the reason is actually is because Adobe has done an excellent job with the display of these things. So, but it was completely developed in open document format. Okay? Um, I just like showing the PDFs just on CRISPR when I get around. All right, so we use it to run our business. We have hundreds of Linux servers inside, like web servers and databases, and things like that. Um, there's a lot of open source running in hardware. I am not a hardware guy. I'm a software guy. I forget about hardware all the time. Oh, there it is. Right? I know it's, you know, I'm just not a hardware guy. I think you know what I mean. Um, but hardware has invented software. Right? Uh, that's what makes it interesting. So it's not just, though, the hardware we create. If you go and buy a piece of hardware that has IBM on it, we may not have made that at all. We may have what's called OEM, right? And then they made it the right color, and they put the whole name on it, and lo and behold, you just bought an IBM, whatever. Okay. Increasingly, those whatevers have open source code that so that, that's happening a lot. Um, we put it in our software, so something like the Webster App Server, right, which is the number one commercial app server in the world. It is a great product in the sense of being very nice and profitable. Okay? I'd like to have a hundred of those babies. Okay, the way that you know, works. For seven years we battled BEA. Okay. We finally got to be number one, and we turned around, and there's j -Boss. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? But what does that mean? We're not going to say, we give up. Right? Whoops. Oh, well, there's open source. We're still the number one commercial, right? Now, WebSphere itself has open source code in it. So the XML support, the web services support, a lot of this support is. Right? And there'll be more over time as well. Um, and a lot of that, in fact, is uh, code that we gave to Apache and then evolved in different ways. And then we took various drafts you know, different times and brought it back in here. Right? Now, we decided when we did this analysis in, in 2013, 
California in 2004 about what are we going to do about these open source Java web app servers. Now, there, are, there are several things we could do. So I co-sponsored this, this analysis. So option zero was, let's do nothing. Let's just pretend this will go away. It's a bad thing. No one's going to really do anything. And it was called zero for a reason. This was a psychological thing on our part to impress upon people what we thought the value of this option was. Okay. Um, and the other types of options were really what you could imagine. Okay. One option was, you know, maybe we should buy a company that's out there that's already established. Another option was to take our code that we had, you know, put our arms around that, repackage it, and open source that. Now, at that time, there was JBoss, there was Geronimo and Apache, and there was Jonas coming out of Europe. Okay. So this option of, in this particular case, taking our own code and open sourcing it would create a fourth player. We really didn't think we needed in this particular right, That was the analysis. So we weren't going to ignore it. We weren't going to take our own body of code and just open source that. So therefore, we had to look to some of the existing players. And what we ultimately did was we bought a company called Blue Code, which had some of the prime developers of Geronimo. All right, so Apache Geronimo, that's the one we decided to back. Okay. Um, and further develop that. We, we have a version of that we maintain. You know, you can get for free or if you want maintenance, you pay for that and so forth. And what that does for us is in this Western family is yes, we still have the proprietary now. Right? The scale up and you want to run them on 10,000 machines you can do that. Really great management tools. So if you want to run Geronimo you know, in your office or a work group or something larger, it's there. We'll support that as well. So what it provides for us, and again, remember we're big, is anybody who wants any type of Java web app server, we got them for you. We got the free ones, we got the little ones, we got the medium sized ones, and we got the big ones. Right? And in this way, from our perspective, we can therefore maximize our revenue in this part of the business potential. Right? If you want to go strictly open source, excellent. We'll help you. Have it for free, or if you want to ask, we'll help you. And so this is how we're trying to be in, in, in transition here. What does the market need? And from our business models, what can we provide? Okay. Um, so all these, these, these other things. Are the as well. But I did want to emphasize that particular example. Now, when it comes to government, I know there's a lot of discussion here. Uh, this is happening all around the world. All right, every government, to some degree, is looking at this. Mostly the larger governments, um, but also larger regional governments, and so forth. Um, it doesn't mean they're doing anything about it, but they're starting to think about the cost of that. Now, several years ago, and I believe this was 2004, toward the end of 2004. Um, it could be 2005, so maybe this was remember. Australia did very interesting thing. And they produced this document, which is called A Guide to Open Source Software for, for Australian Government Agencies. As far as I'm concerned, you should replace this with for United States government agencies, for Malaysian government agencies, for Singaporean government agencies, for UK government agencies. It's a really good document. And this is where it comes from. Right? Think of procurement people in governments. Right? These people know how to buy commercial software. They've been doing that for years. They know what the licenses are like. They know how to have multiple suppliers. They know how to negotiate with these suppliers. They know how to deal with system integrators for proprietary software. They've done it hundreds, if not thousands of times. Now, in walks open source. And open source people say, we're going to give you this for free. Don't worry about it. It's a brand new model. It's the right way of thinking about things. You're a good person. 
freedom, sharing, you know. And these guys are going, can I just buy it, please? You know, I know how to buy things. You know, you're making me really uncomfortable. Okay. And then, of course, the issues of how you maintain these things is important. And is it going away? And whose neck are you going to choke when it breaks in the middle of the night? And things. All right, so what Australia did was say, look, guys, fundamentally, whatever you're doing, when we look at our IT systems and how we engage with vendors or anybody else who provides things to the government, we look at value for our money. That's the goal. It's very general, but it should be enough for you to, to try to think about this. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell you what open source software is. We're going to tell you where it comes from. We're going to tell you why it comes from certain places. We're going to tell you how you can compare this with proprietary software, what your support options are. And you know what? By the time you're done reading this, realize that sometimes many aspects of it, getting software is getting software. Sometimes it's proprietary, sometimes it's open source. There are far more similarity than differences, right? When people sometimes will want to admit. So this is a very sane, logical, calm. So what this does is it brings open source up to the same level of consideration and knowledge Right? And then at that point, they've got to say, well, that means it's better. Not philosophically, not ideologically, does open source deliver more value for our money? And I know how to compare it. Just as I might be comparing DB2 by IBM DB2 database to an Oracle database or anything else. Well, we've all been from Postgres, right? Right? So, we really, more governments do things like that was steal this, share it. Okay. So, we did a study, um, because I just want to show you this as an example, because most of the open source we should talk about is very horizontal in nature. So, when we talk about Linux, right, I can talk about Linux in the petroleum industry, I can talk about Linux in healthcare, I can talk about Linux in insurance. Yeah. Linux is Linux is Linux, it's an operating system. Right. Um, we, we ask the question saying, let's look at vertical industries. Tell me about the software developed in healthcare that is open source, that is only useful in healthcare. Linux is broad, useful anywhere, it doesn't count. Okay. I'm asking for healthcare specific software. So it's not software that I can just pick up and suddenly start buying windshield covers, right? Things like this. And you know, today there's actually very little. For vertical industries, just for insurance, just for financial uh, services, it's very little. But it's very specific to one industry, right? We're starting to see like, ERP, you know, CRM, things like this kind of come up, but I call process. But that's still not specific to necessarily one industry. The one industry or area that is absolutely leading the way though, in producing specific open source software to solve their problems is education. Right. For lots of reasons. The economics of the education industry are very different, let's say, from the economics of the petroleum industry, the banking industry, the So. In the area for, uh, if you will, electronic courseware, course management tools, um, there are several things. There's one called Sakai, which is very nice to like that one rather than quite a bit. It, it's written in Java. It's got a very enterprising type of feel to it. Um, it's developed by several very large state universities in the United States, such as University of Michigan, University of Illinois, University of Indiana, maybe not Indiana, uh, uh, University of California, things like that. This is another one. So first of all, this gives you an idea that there's competition in the education industry for open source course management systems. So there's not just one, there's more than one. So look at these numbers over here, and I'll read this for you, because clearly you can't see this. 
But our, our chart starts back here in June of 2003 and goes to March of 2007. And overall, this is the total known sites, total known websites that are deploying this course management system. By the way, this one's written in PHP. Okay? And this one tends to have a very grassroots. People hear about it, a particular professor will hear about it and say, I want to use that in my class. As opposed to the university coming and saying, this is what we're all using. That's nice growth. That's not even, that's not linear growth. Right? I would love to have a product if this was the revenue. <laughs> okay. And to give you uh, some idea about downloads too, because this is another measurement, right? If you're looking at if you have a project here. Uh, so like anything else, with downloads per month, you'd rather it didn't keep going down. You want to see growth, right? So you want to see, first of all, sustain. Flat is actually not that bad consistently have more people download and then you look for an improvement. So this one starts June 2004, a little bit less than 20,000 downloads per month. And we get, uh, for some reason, February of this month was really good. It may have been the beginning of term or something that might have been a spike. Here, um, that was, let's say, around 70,000. We dropped back down last month to a little bit less than 60,000. That's helpful. That's good. Trend is generally up, okay, and we're seeing more sites. Over a million students are in classes that have used this course. Okay. So we're starting to see this. The big question I have is what will happen in other industries? Will we see, in fact, banking specific open sources? We'll see it vary in different ways. Um, but as you go out, Fascinating to watch the next few years. What, what happens here? All right. Um, this is just a, a quick thing, you know, which I won't go through. But open source business models. Right. Um, some people seem to feel that there are a finite number of them, and we know them all. And that's it. Um, I'm more of an optimist that we're going to get smarter and more clever about these types of things. Uh, and so, you know, the usual sorts of things, the web sphere model, as I mentioned before, embedding open source proprietary products, uh, maybe a Google model, such as using Linux for a hosted service, in this case a search service, um, subscriptions, um, everything one has to do to get people using open source, integrating with the products teaching, dual licensing, so mod MySQL, sugar CRM, and so forth, um, running proprietary software over Linux, so Oracle databases on Linux, so our stuff on Linux, and things like this. Patronage. Patronage. Uh, patronage. So what does patronage mean? We do not have a Linux distribution. Okay? We use the enterprise Novell and Red Hat. Okay. Nevertheless, we have hundreds of software developers who contribute to the Linux program. We don't get a dime from that software. There. I'd love you to buy some hardware for this. All right? That's a good business. Okay? We'd love you to run WebSphere on the top of this. That works well. Of course, very nice. By the way, that's Linux running on Intel box or Linux running on the okay? I mean, think of this from IBM's perspective as well. The value of something like Linux. IBM, for, for decades, has had multiple hardware companies. Right, so re oh, recently we've had Intel, right? But we've got P series and I series and C series, right? And they've all had previous names, you know, always 400 ones. But generally speaking, we have four different hardware ones. So let's forget the entire rest of the universe, you know, the Sparks of the world, and all these other things. IBM itself has this issue of wouldn't it be lovely to have a single operating system that ran on all of our hardware? Right? So why do we like these things? Forget the rest of the world. It solves a lot of our problems. Right. And by the way, it's also good for the rest of the world. Okay. Let's talk about data. Um, so it used to be the case 
that the software developers, when they created applications, they would figure out some way of saving information. Right, so you create a new, you know, let's say you were the first one to develop, um, you know, so audio, so, you know, just some sort of format to save music. If you're the first one, you can save it somehow, I'll be clever. You know, I'll figure out how to save it on this, so I can read it back into my application to edit it or do whatever else. So I'm just pretending you're operating in a vacuum. And the early 80s, this was exactly the situation. So my first PC was called completely unnetworked. I just sat there. I had no motive when I first got it. If I wanted to share a document with you, I'd print it out and hand you the paper. That was the network. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so this was almost very natural, this idea of I write an application, I figure out how to save on disk, and I did. That's just the way it was, because they were islands. Right. Then networking starts, right? First in offices. Right, the, the, the lands that started in offices and things like this, and then of course modems and broadband and, and things like that. And so very idealistic people started saying, wait a minute, we have multiple products, you know, or software applications in this category. Right? We have multiple different music players. We have multiple word processors. Right? We have multiple pieces of accounting software. You know, word processing is word processing. There's not a lot of innovation that's going into word processing formats. Right? What do we have? We have letters, we have punctuation, we have words and sentences and paragraphs. And we can make them big or small. <laughs> right? Or bold or italic. I mean, get the idea. So they add on a few other things. Those are documents. That's it, and we don't know how to do that for years and years ago. So one could say, hey, you know, we could come up with a common format for whatever we're talking about, whatever area. And therefore, people should just get together and share, work together so that every application can do this. And this is good for customers because, of course, customers want choice of applications. Customers don't want choice of standards or choice of formats. That makes their life difficult increases the complexity of the system when you deal with multiple specifications or multiple standards in the same thing. So customers love this. Vendors hate this. What do you mean these guys can read my data? They might not buy my product anymore. I'm not doing that. Okay. So this is one of these situations where ideally you would have a situation where you would naturally come to this because it would help the customer, but from the perspective of the people who the software. And so, you know, I'm really depressed because I'm such an optimistic guy and I'd love us to do this. You know, for something to share it and doing things the right way from a computer science perspective. Because you know what we're going to do is we're going to design this really well, you know, whatever our area is, because we've got smart people working together to understand architecture and, and, and structuring information. So I'm depressed. And so while I was off being depressed, the web was born. And lo and behold, we've got HTML, right? Which isn't perfect. <coughs> You know, of the hundreds of millions of web pages, there are some that some browser can get on. You probably know why. Okay? But it's pretty good. Statistically, it's pretty great that I can sit here with Firefox. I can go days without hitting a web page that it gaps on because it's something here. Okay? And things like that. So this utopian view. And, you know, people have said this to me when I talk about this. They say, you know, you're talking about the world the way you want it to be, not the way it is. You know, what a shame. Yeah, I should just give up. We should all give up. We should never try for progress. Right? But the fact is, is that, you know, some very smart people 
figure it out how to do this. Other people should do it. Firefox has done a tremendous amount here. But even be, well before that, the Apaches of the world, the work of the WC on the standards, Tim Burton's lead by a lot of what he did, including what he did in the last few years around royalty for standards, he fundamentally changed the entire nature of the IT industry, driven by actual open standards and open source core of creating. So this is the web. It's not perfect, but it's really good. And as I pointed out, ties in standards and open source. So the challenge for all of us, especially all of you who are much younger than I am, right, is do it again. Find another area. Find another area, do it again. Keep doing it over and over and over again. Keep repeating the success. And when you're thinking about these things and what's possible, and what's idealistic, and what's too optimistic, think of what's happening with the web. Has the web caused innovation? Yeah. It's simple. Basically, the web itself is fairly simple as far as the technology goes. There are companies that did exist. There's wealth that did exist. There's implementation of software that did Right? Even later innovations like Ajax, which uses basically three standards, some of which go back 10 years almost. Right? The smart thing was putting it together. And now we have Web 2.0. Right? We have a handy interactive website. Things like that. Keep doing it. Okay. So, um, standards are good. Standards drive software interoperability. Other people will say there's a very easy way to get to interoperability. Buy all my products. My products work together really well. So it's simple. Right? We, we used to think that about 20 years ago. It worked okay for a while. And then it stopped working one day. We lost a lot of money. Yeah, this openness stuff has been the way we've done it. All right, so standards break this dependence on proprietary methods, trade secrets. Hey, we'll make a deal. Your software will work with mine. That's all right. All right, things like this. You build on top of these things. All right. Now, what this tends to do is, if we say it levels the playing field, it lets, lets a lot of people come in because I can read other people's data. Maybe I can come up with a clever little piece of software that does something the way but it hurts to get leveled, right? It hurts. If you're chugging along in an industry and you're doing these things, and standards come in and disrupt your position in the market, I don't like that. I'm going to fight back in some very interesting ways, although I won't exactly maybe tell you why I'm fighting on these other languages. Okay? So standardization can be very scary for whom it will potentially cause them to lose market share, right? It will potentially allow customers to go elsewhere and use other people's software. How do you fight this? You can't create better products at lower prices. People will want to lose your product. Maybe naive, maybe optimistic. Okay. It's scary for people who have tried cash cows. A cash cow, if you're not familiar with the term, is something that almost irrationally generates a lot of money. People keep buying it. And, and for whatever reason, it doesn't cost you too much to continue to produce it. You make a tremendous amount of profit. So it's something that really stands out as part of your portfolio that you make a lot of money on. Now, why is that good? Because it pays for all your failures. It pays for all your R&D. Because not every product is successful. They can be great products, great technology, and exactly at the wrong time when you're trying to sell it to the wrong people. Right? So cash cows are OK. Right? You love to have a lot of them but they really are what financially fuel other things you do. And if standardization comes along and threatens the cash cow, you're going to fight. You're 
you're going to say, well, I don't think this standard is such a good idea, right? Um, or there is this other final aspect, well, you know, it's, it's not trivial operating in this very open world. But the continued debate, how people really make money in using open source, right? And there are a lot of people who are not making They do it for different reasons. But there are increasingly people who are in different ways. So I'm going to end this with one particular example. So what's driving these types of things? Well, you know, one thing is these classical applications have too many features. You know, by the time you're on version 37 or 12 or whatever, you know, you're really trying to figure out what the heck are we going to do to this thing. You know, that's going to get people excited to buy the next version. So they've got the previous version. They've already paid you the money previous version, you need them to pay for the upgrade if, you know, if you're talking about a commercial situation. And people are starting to say, you know, this thing does what we need it to do. Right? And then they look around and say, well, not only that, there's this open source option that does what I need to do. And I can put it on that computer and that computer and that computer and give it to my friend and my three children and my wife and my daughter. And the price is still zero. Right? That, that's a good idea. Not only that, the, the fundamental nature of, of how we deal with software is changing. You know, Google, the Google Docs, like right? online word processing, doesn't have every feature of Word Perfect or Microsoft Word. No, absolutely not. Is it missing maybe some things you love? Yeah, probably. Is it getting better? Yeah, it seems to be. You know? Are you downloading new code? <coughs> get those new features, not manually, they just show up, right? It's a web 2.0 application with, you know, storage on the web, anywhere you have a browser and broadband connection. Yeah. And other people do this as well. I'll use them as an example. Salesforce.com for customer management, right? Software as a service, right? With, 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 yeah. So not only are you maybe in a situation let's say looking at desktop software, but saying that there are increasingly high value, well-featured open source alternatives. And this is true in the enterprise as well. But this shift to information being on the web right, could be on the internet, right? It doesn't have to be in the open. It's changing the way people think about this. So the very core of the notion of where software lives Right. How you pay for it, whether all the fonts or subscription is changing. And so, because of this, there are going to be software categories that in the next decade almost go away you know, in terms of what people made billions of dollars on five or ten years ago, ten years from now, they just want to file it. That's these options. Young people. I always use my kids as an example. They like it, but they don't ever actually hear what I say about it. I have a 17 year old daughter and a 10 year old son. Right? The web in the mainstream is about 12 years, 1995. You know, 10 folks were doing it before then, but really mainstream is around 95. So my daughter doesn't remember before the web. And my son was born after really the web. He knows nothing different. Right? This, is, this is the middle. You know, it's the internet. I mean, he, you know, when he was nine, he used Wikipedia to look up things. I know he said the same. Let's look at what they're saying. <laughs> but you know about it, you know? Um, so these young folks who are very technology savvy, right, don't come with any sort of notions that say the software industry must be just like this. Right? Because <laughs> their software industry is very different from our software industry, my software industry. This is the post-master generation, whole peer to peer stuff. And they have very different ideas about digital content, including software, and how it works and things like this. Okay. And then other types of things too. There's notions of mashups, web services, 
basically distributed services with published APIs that can plug together to use these composite applications, and things like virtual ones. Okay? So, um, I'm going to skip over this um, bit for the sake of time. Service oriented architecture is also extremely important. Um, if you go to my website, which is sucor.com, I have a blog there. Redheartsline.com slash blog. Okay, we'll do that. I have a lot of stuff talking about open source and standards and VM and SOA and things like this. Um, but what I want to um, actually I'm going to make one point here. Um, so this is a slide that I would typically use to talk to commercial people about. You know, so software providers or CIOs and companies. Um, and this is just, you know, how do you start getting used to this idea of using open source software? You all use it. You may try to convince other people. But I want to get down to this question right here. And I want you to think of this in terms of these commercial software companies that are out there. Like an IBM, like an Oracle, or whatever else. This industry moves really quickly. As I said, the web is 12 years old. Blogging is technically 10 years old. But again, in mainstream, five, four, five. The United States, let's say, ask any politician or journalist, has blogging changed your business? Right? And I know it's true here. <laughs> <laughs> So we have 
right now we're 24 islands with 36 on the order. Okay. We're doing a lot of experimentation. We seriously have to understand that it's experimentation. <laughs> it, it, it's not a done deal, okay, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. So here, this looks sort of like an office building. Right? There don't happen to be any avatars here um, at the moment when I took this, but you can imagine you know, a customer and avatar walking in here and some IBM person showing over and walking over and saying, can I help you? Is there anything you'd like to know about IBM and SOA? You know, would you like to know how Webster Business Integrator you know, uses SOA and things like that? And they'd say, well, you know, I'd really like to know about your support of all of these standards for SOA. Say, okay, excuse me. And then materializing out of nowhere, just teleporting in from someplace, uh, is somebody who maybe worked on one of the standards for this who can answer the question. Now, it's not live, it's not real, all right, in terms of the person really, really being there, but it is not instant messaging and it is not a phone call. And what you get are the casual interactions where I just thought of something, let's talk about this. So people wander in. Just like in real life, you might go into an electronic store because you're killing time while someone else is shopping, you know, and then you walk out with the stereo and things are just crap, right? Things like this. So it's, it's worth exploring. So it's worth for us to explore is this a way to engage with our customers, right? To play potential customers. So another area um, would be retail. All right, so Circuit City, um, they're at least in the United States, they sell electronics. So they sell televisions as well as appliances, um, stereos, they sell movies, they sell games, computers, hard drives, everything like this. This is part of the inside of that building. So you can walk in and hear some speakers and some stereos. Uh, can't quite do that. Some of other sorts of things here. Um, but, so, so, so let, let me tell you a story here. Um, I, I, for the end of last year, I decided I needed a new stereo receiver. I've had maybe two stereo receivers in my entire life. Just, you know, when the last little light goes out, and you can't see something on it. I finally decided I would do that. And so I, I went to decide to buy a new stereo receiver. And, you know, you can't buy a stereo receiver. You have to get home theaters right now, right? The center console, they're not this big, they're this big. You know, and you turn them around, part of the reason why they're this big is because they've got like 67 things in the back that you can play in, <laughs> including fiber optic. And there's nothing in my house that's fiber optic. Um, and I'm pretty good at tech. You know, I build stuff and all this. And it took me a week to get this thing wired. <laughs> The way I did it was I took everything out and I put it on the floor. Yeah, you know, so there's the TPP, right? Here's the television, here's the VCR, here's the everything else, right? Put this thing in the middle. And I finally got it to work, and then I put little labels on it. Okay. Now, so how would my life have been better if I had called phone support? Right? So I'm talking on the phone to somebody. Is this person going to help me? Maybe a little. But they're going to say, oh, count over one, two, three, four, put it down, play. How do you know? I mean, it's, it's just, right? I could bring it to the store. But I'm not bringing my TV to the store and my DVD and everything like that. I could pay someone a lot of money to come to my house. And I figured out that's why there are these people who come to your house. And it's all, it's this whole business, right? Okay, well imagine this though, all right? So this is some slightly more interactive and there's this notion of inventory. So I could go in there and say, you know, I just bought the JVC 380D model here. I need a little help with this one. And so this person could go over to like a table and take a virtual one of these out. It's not real, it's made of, you know, cubes and spheres and things like this, but it kind of looks real. You put it on the table and you can walk me through 
I'm sitting there kind of looking at the screen here, and I've got mine right there. And I'm typing, or, or there's a dead voiceover ID now as well with this person. It's not real, it's not a phone, it's not just a message, it's something different in the middle for this. So we think, for example, it's going to have a lot to do with post sales including computer support, okay? And we'll have pre-sales support. And maybe it'll have applications to distance healthcare, to distance education, e-learning, maybe. Why don't we give it a shot, right? There are other virtual worlds that are out there as well. This is one that has just taken off and has uh, certain characteristics which are really rather nice. I can talk a long time about that, that as well. Um, January 8th, they announced that they were open sourcing the client. So the bit that runs under Windows and after Windows. So it's where you actually see the graphics as you walk around. It's how you build the furniture and the houses and clothes and walk and chat with people. Um, that's good. Um, and so we'll see better graphics, faster, and all sorts of good things like this. Now, these were some numbers from about two days ago, all right? Um, so the total residents, so these are essentially, if you think of this as the total number of individual accounts. So one person could have multiple accounts. It's a one-to-one mapping of this and, if you will, an avatar by the representation. I got a call for example. Um, but this is 5.6 million, right? That number was about half that four months ago. People are joining at a rate of about 26,000 a day. Okay. Logged on in the last 60 days, almost 1.7 million. Online now, 34,000. The okay, US dollar spent in the last 24 hours, about 1.5 million dollars. Let's just pretend it'll go away. Is this an option zero? Right? Or should we experiment and think about it? And think of what it implies. Right? Now, I personally don't think this is just going to replace the web. We're not simply going to go from web pages to this. I think this will augment that. And in fact, pretty soon you'll see as you walk around in here, you can actually see web pages, real live web pages in the world. Okay. So we're going to have a kind of hybrid type. In fact, indeed, you can run in certain virtual worlds via your web browser. You can go to a site and so you've got to think about all these things meshing in interesting ways. It's naive to just say it's the, totally the next thing. Um, but you also have to think it's not just a game. Right? Dozens of companies are trying to figure out if they can reach customers in new ways. Politicians are doing this. Politicians were running for presidents, right? In 2008, the US already set up virtual entities. And they have around the world as well because you need a way of meeting people. And, and you know, my wife ran for political office last year. She must have gone to a thousand houses knocking on the door, you know, you know, county fairs, <laughs> any way to meet people. So again, it augments. It's different. It's additional. Maybe in some cases it's better. So some of the implications of this, just to, and this is totally just as a, as a a mind experiment here. Right? So I'm not saying this is the only one in the universe forever and ever. You all gotta go do this, whatever. It's pretty cool. You know, if you've never done it, you can get a free account and play and things like this. But let's just think about this a little expansive. So the client went first, okay, which will lead to better user interface because more people are involved and fix that, fix bugs and so forth. At some point they said the server will go. So these are the back end systems databases, things that actually push down the geometry to deal with the interaction of multiple avatars in this area. Right. One server controls a certain rectangle area of the land where they come together and you're really passing from server to server. It's really kind of interesting idea. But right now the model is there's one second life. Think of it as one planet. Lots of issues. Right. Now, what happens though if this action goes open source? Well, what's going to happen is that people can take the code and put it on their own servers. Okay. For various reasons. So 
what we will have is the official second life run by Linden lines. And then we'll have other like instantiation lines. Some of which may become commercial services. Now, one way of, of imagining this now, though, is, you know, as I said, there's, there's currency in this world. They're called Lindens. There's about 266 Lindens to a US dollar. All right. When we get multiple instantiations of this, they will look like multiple planets. Right. They will develop individual currencies. So just as when I arrived at the airport here and I exchanged some money, right, I didn't get 100% of the value of that, right? Whatever the bank was took a little cut. Right? And you repeat that several thousand times, and financial exchange is a pretty good business, right? Smart guy, things like this. So we don't get financial exchange between these virtual worlds. And as I showed you just now, very, very early, there was a $1.5 billion spent in one day. If these things start replicating, you're going to get real life banks engage in this because that's real money we're talking about. There's already uh, Century 21, which is an American real estate company, has set up offices to help sell virtual land. That's what <laughs> Maybe they'll get a company, okay? So this, as we shift here, what work proprietary protocols, and Lyndon is actively doing this, they're moving to open protocols, like Asian. Right. So first they got the damn thing working, and now they're opening it up increasingly more. Money comes from providing the service. Right now, you know, they don't sell the viewer. Download the viewer for free. When they open source the server, there it is, okay. But they provide the hardware. They provide the uptime, right? They provide the quality of service, all these types of things. And they stay competitive by providing better quality of service. Does this sound more like an open source business model to right? So they're transitioning. So, so can this possibly provide some sort of balance? And that's why I'm saying as a thought exercise, well, yeah. Think about it. Shake up the way you think about these things. I'm actually hoping, you know, in, in certain particular industries, it improves some of the standardization, some of the because some industries, they've been doing the same thing for 30 years. It changes the way they think. Maybe we can cut through some of the stuff. All right, so we'll end with this. Right? When we talk about software interoperability standards, so these are the interfaces, the software interfaces, the protocols, and the formats, the information formats. These include things like word processing formats, but also healthcare records, and anything that put in electronic form and shared for some reason will not be proprietary. Okay? Think of this in terms of service-oriented architecture. This is how the services connect to each other. If you have proprietary specifications for communication between services, you are paying a tax. I call it an SOA tax. Alright? I don't think people will think that's acceptable. When you design software, right, you don't just sit down there on line one and you know end up at line 14,000. I hope you design it according to some sort of higher level principles. Okay, there are lots of them, right? And they've been involved. Object oriented modeling, lots of things, right? Okay. In addition, I think because we will be living in this kind of combination world of open source and proprietary software really living together. This notion of saying this part of the software must be open. This is the base. This is the infrastructure. This part could be proprietary. This is reflected today already in some open source licenses. Okay? So that will be part of design. I said this before, some market categories will vanish. Okay. Finally, look at what the kids are doing. Some of you I consider kids, by the way. <laughs> but I'm here, I'll think of my 10, my 17. So I told you before, there were, in that particular snapshot, there were about 35,000 adults on Second Life at that time spending money. 
This is an online service my son loves. It's called RuneScape. So typically, it's a bunch of 11-year-olds. They run around. They dress up as knights, and they have swords and things. And they make deals, and they trade stuff. And they go on quests. It's not World of Warcraft quite. Right? <laughs> it's, 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 it's not quite 3D. I call it 2.5D. They kind of rely on your angle. <laughs> There are currently 167, 561 people online. So whereas 35,000 adults were using Second Life, this time of the day, 160,000 11-year-olds are playing this. And then you throw in World of Warcraft, that this number is like 700,000 online. And all the other ones. This is the way they think. I brought my kid, my son, on Second Life for a little bit, right? To play this in half an hour. He was building stuff. You know, he was creating stuff. He was hollowing them out. He was wrapping textures around. He's stacking them on something. You know, something had to stop and pull it in the backyard. Virtual. Okay, so, as Steve Jobs used to say, they think different. That's where we're going to get the inspiration. We're doing a lot of these things. For us, as a big corporation, big software corporation, it's been around for decades. Right? We're trying to be a little bit more nimble, aggressive, tying into technologies like this. So whether it's technology trends like we're doing the internet, or virtual worlds, or this open source phase transition, you know, we're trying to do it. And I, I hope you realize we're willing to tell you why. Okay? We haven't done it all perfectly, we won't do it all perfectly. Okay? But in some sense, you can observe as we make this 